My name is Jean Seberg. Where were you born? In Marshalltown, Iowa. When? November 13th, 1938. That makes you what age? 17 and 11 months. Tonight, the first in a special series of biographical inquiries. The story of Jean Seberg is a Cinderella story gone sour. And unknown at 18, she burst upon the cinema scene as Joan of Arc in a flare of worldwide publicity. Too much of it, too soon. A woman of beauty and pluck and compassion, Jean was victimized and eventually she was defeated by an FBI probe before she took her own life. In a moment, the remarkable tale of Jean Seberg. On August 30, 1979, Jean Seberg, an American movie actress living in Paris, decided at the age of 40 to end her life. They found her finally nine days after she disappeared in the back seat of her car, wrapped in a blanket, two pill bottles by her side. And they buried her here in Montparnasse Cemetery. In 1958, when I interviewed Jean Seberg, the notion of her suicide would have been unimaginable. She was 19, radiant, innocent. Jean Seberg was born in Marshalltown, Iowa, population approximately 23,000. Today, she stands on the threshold of a motion picture career that could make her an idol of millions. But Miss Seberg's Cinderella story is more than just grist for the movie magazines. It says something about America's dreams and values. For me personally, what I wanted couldn't be found in Marshalltown, and not in Marshalltown, which is a wonderful town, but any small town or, or any town of that size, because I wanted more than anything to act, and certainly the opportunities for acting are greater in New York than in Marshalltown. I used to work in my father's drugstore, and I actually was fired <laughs> by him because I spent all my time off in corners reading movie magazines, and, and then uh, when I was 12, I saw uh, Brando in his first film, The Men. For some reason, it had a, a very great effect on me and made me more interested in acting and at that time in, in stage acting. When I first interviewed her, I guess she was uh, 18, 17, 18, and I was struck by the fact that she was so poised at that age. As parents, we were struck by her being so poised. It, it just... Uh, she seemed uh, older than uh, her age. It dumbfounded us. Is that our girl? You know, we were so proud of her, too. But she continued and just on and on and on. Were you anxious that she be an actress? No. Oh, really? No. Why? Well, it was the farthest thing of her mind, but she was determined. She wanted to. Of course, this opportunity came up. You mean without a premature? Without a premature, and there's no stopping her. Good morning. Good morning. What's your name? My name is Jean Seberg. Where were you born? In Marshalltown, Iowa. When? November 13th, 1938. That makes you what age? 17 and 11 months. And 11 months, mm -hmm. almost 18. Mm -hmm. And do you want to be an actress? Very badly. That interview with Otto Preminger was part of the original screen test, which catapulted Seberg from the cornfields of Iowa to the battlefields of 15th century France as Joan of Arc in Preminger's film, St. Joan. Preminger had launched a worldwide talent hunt in 1956 for an unknown to play the lead in his film. Seberg sent in her name and photo. So did some other aspiring actresses. The response was so enormous, the odds against winning were set at 18,000 to one. But the moment Preminger saw Seberg, it was no contest. What was it in Jean Seberg that made you decide to go with her? But it's very difficult to describe it in words. I mean, her personality is the only answer that I can give you. you know? She has an, had a, a, an enchanting personality. You know? And she captivated me. That's, that's the best answer. She captivated me right away. When I met her, I had no more doubt that anybody else should be even considered. 
you were a pretty hard taskmaster. And there's a story that you pushed her pretty hard to see how she would react under stress. Do you remember that? I remember, I, I remember the episode. See, I made her do a scene over and over again. And I said to her, well, is this too much for you? And she said, Mr. Preminger, you know, I will do this scene until you drop dead. <laughs> My dear, her hair. I wear it like this because I am a soldier. Could you fight with your hair stuffed up in those two horns? <laughs> Do you remember your first meeting with Otto Preminger when you were introduced as the father and mother of... Uh... We sure do. Why? Why? Well, we came into his room in there at the Ambassador East, and he was walking around the room chewing a great big red apple. Yeah. He kept on chewing it. He says, you want an apple? And I said, no, thanks. You want a drink? I said, no. What's going on? He said, well, we want to take your girl to New York. I said, I don't want her to go. We do not gobble up little girls in New York. So what, what are you going to do? The girl's determined she's going to go. Yeah. Thrill of a lifetime. I understand your mother and father here in the audience. Did we put on the house lights because... I know that they must have gotten a thrill of a lifetime. Would the mother and dad stand up for your mother? Here, the mother and father of this young Did New York, and by New York, I mean, did the film business gobble her up? It gobbled her up. The making of St. Joan gave Seaberg a severe psychological buffeting. Both the film and her performance were panned by the reviewers. And she fared little better in her next outing, Bonjour Tristesse, in which she was once more directed by the temperamental Preminger. At the age of 19, Seberg had starred in two critical failures. She had also fallen deeply in love with a young French attorney, Francois Moreuil, who in 1958 became her first husband. This is a girl who suddenly was taken out of a very small American town, each of these words meaning a lot in the Midwest. She was propelled, she was uh, jetted in London. She came straight from uh, Seberg's pharmacy to the Claridge's or the Dorchester. She had no education, no background to prepare her to that. The publicity was huge and the, the deus ex machina, the godfather of that was Otto. Otto Preminger. She was terribly scared of him. And I remember Otto calling at 8 o'clock at night, saying, uh, Jean, and as soon as Jean heard his voice, she would start either to cry or to shiver. Really? Absolutely. New York Carol Tribune! As Jean's career was about to go under, it was suddenly resurrected by a film called Breathless. In it, she played a young American student living in Paris who becomes involved with a gangster played by Jean-Paul Belmondo. Il a dit, vous êtes vraiment une dégueulasse. Qu'est-ce que c'est dégueulasse? Breathless turned out to be an international hit, and its success brought Seberg and Moreuil to Hollywood, where Jean was to meet her second husband, Romain Gary. I had met Romain Gary in Paris at two or three cocktail parties, but I didn't know him very well. So he invited us for dinner. And when, a few weeks later, I left uh, for Paris again, where I had work, I said to Romain Gary, please take care of my wife. She'll be alone in California. He said, sure, I'll do. And he did. To Jean Seberg, barely 21 years old, Romain Gary was a figure of immense glamour, a soldier who had fought alongside de Gaulle, an author whose novel, The Roots of Heaven, had won the prestigious Prix Goncourt, Gary was in 1959 France's Consul General in Los Angeles. He was also 24 years older than Seberg. Gary swept Jean off her feet and out of her marriage to Moreuil. By the end of the year, she had moved back to Paris with Gary 
and into his apartment at 108 Rue du Bac. It was there that Charles Collingwood talked to her for a segment of the CBS television series, Person to Person. Hello, Jean. Nice to visit you. Thank you. I'm delighted, you know, because my family in Iowa, in Marshalltown, has no idea how I live in Paris. This way they have a chance to see. Well, we'll show them. Who's that with you, your concierge? Yes, this is my concierge, Madame Jerry. Madame, what's the thing? She's helping me with Bonjour, my bread Madame. and shopping. Bonjour, Madame. Bonjour. Bonjour, Monsieur. <laughs> She's delighted mais to be bon on American oui, television. C'est qui plein, maintenant? Oui, il peut. Oui. 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 Non, non, mais ça se voit, mais ça aussi n'est pas quand même. She's delighted to be on American television. This is Allez. her first appearance. <laughs> it was apparent that Jean Seberg had arrived. By the middle 60s, she, Gary, and their small son, Diego, moved back to California so Jean could pursue her film career full-time. In a movie called Lilith, she co-starred with Warren Beatty and received the best reviews of her career. In 1968, she appeared with Clint Eastwood and Lee Marvin in Paint Your Wagon and became romantically involved with Eastwood. When word of their affair reached Gary, he demanded, and eventually received, a divorce. It was during this emotionally turbulent period that Jean became involved with a charismatic black nationalist named Hakim Jamal. Jean, who had been interested in civil rights since the age of 14 when she joined the NAACP, poured thousands of dollars into Jamal's Montessori school project in Los Angeles and thousands more into Jamal himself. But his extreme positions on race turned Jean away from him and toward another civil rights group, the Black Panthers. Former Black Panther official Elaine Brown was her close friend. She wanted to do something. She had been floundering around in a number of nationalist organizations, black nationalist organizations, and ill-treated. You know, when you, it's, it's tough to make a contribution when nobody wants it. And I don't mean a financial contribution, I mean a, a human contribution, which may, may not include money. So she, what more center of attention could you come to at that time than the Black Panther Party? The Black Panthers were one of the media events of the late 60s. Their leadership was remarkably adept at tapping the wallets of Hollywood's and New York's white liberal communities. Particularly able at this was Bobby Seale, the chairman and co-founder of the Panthers. It was Seale who put the touch on Marlon Brando and Vanessa Redgrave, and Seale who recruited the actress who, by some accounts, eventually gave the Panthers a total of $150,000, Gene Seberg. We lack that racist mentality of the nationalist blacks. This is the Black Panther Party who has coalitions with other white groups, etc., who are talking about a progressive philosophy that relates to people of the world, okay? This is what's happening, and this is what I feel. This is what I see when she's jumping off the edge of a chair listening to me and rapping to me, and I'm rapping, this, rapping what we're talking about, and they're firing questions at me. She was interested in really what we were about. What was our program? I mean, nobody ever asked us. People said, oh, Panthers, hurry up, let's have a cocktail party, hit it, Beverly Hills, so-and-so drive, so-and-so drive, go. She was not interested in giving cocktail parties for us. She was not interested in making a num doing another number on us and being able to go then to her friends in Iowa or somewhere and say, you know, look at this, Black Panthers. You know, and that was chic in those days. You have to realize that was chic. If white Hollywood liberals were natural targets for the Panthers, the Panthers and their contributors were themselves targets of another organization. By 1969, the Black Panther Party had become the number one enemy of the FBI. David Hilliard, sitting next to Bobby Seale, is a former Black Panther chief of staff, and he recalls the FBI's tactics. When the FBI couldn't uh, discredit us in any other way, uh, they'd already considered us terrorists, that we were all about killing whites and all of the, uh, the young babies, and just totally without any virtue. Uh, since that didn't go very well with, uh, with our supporters, then certainly they reverted to, um, to the old taboo about uh, sex between black women and white men. And since this woman was a, an actress with uh, media popularity, she was bigger than life, they scandalized. And this was just another, as Bobby say, uh, attempt out of their bag of dirty tricks. Hilliard's words are more than just rhetoric. For documents obtained from the FBI under the Freedom of Information Act revealed that on June the 3rd, 1969, the FBI began what it called an active, discreet investigation of Gene Seberg. And because of Seberg's relationships with Hakim Jamal and with a prominent Black Panther named Raymond Hewitt, the FBI referred to her as follows, 
an internationally known white American actress with black extremist relationships and sympathies, is reportedly a sex pervert. Then, believing that Jean was pregnant by Panther Raymond Hewitt, the FBI's Los Angeles office requested permission from Washington to plant an item which would publicize the pregnancy of Jean Seberg, cause her embarrassment, and serve to cheapen her image with the general public. Headquarters approved the plan, but said it would be better to wait approximately two additional months until Seberg's pregnancy would be obvious to everyone. In the meantime, gossip columnist Joyce Haber of the LA Times had been fed the story and had printed it. Haber called Seberg Miss A. A few months later, in August of 1970, Newsweek carried the same story. It named Seberg, writing that Jean and French author Romain Gary, 56, are reportedly about to remarry, even though the baby that Jean expects in October is by another man, a black activist she met in California. Although it's still unclear from whom Haber and Newsweek got the story, it is clear that without FBI involvement, the story would almost certainly not have surfaced. How did the FBI obtain their information? In the Bay Area at that time, phone calls made to and from Black Panther headquarters were secretly monitored by the FBI, and the FBI tape of an April 21st, 1970 phone call between Elaine Brown and Raymond Hewitt in Berkeley and Gene Seberg in Paris would seem to offer evidence that Hewitt might have been the father of Gene's expected child. And the fact is that Hewitt had had an affair with Seberg. But when she became pregnant, Hewitt was in California, and Seberg at that time was making a film in Mexico. We played the tape of that phone call for Elaine Brown. This is Raymond Hewitt and Gene Seberg talking. Big tummy. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to have anything to do with it. I told you what I called you. Yes, but I can't remember. Johnny Appleseed. Oh, no, she didn't tell me that. Yeah, planting your little seeds around. <laughs> Johnny Appleseed planting your little seeds around. But you don't want to know what that's about? <laughs> so funny. This is funny to me. Yeah. Raymond Hewitt was having another baby at that time. Two other babies. Did you know that? Mm -mm. One of them was mine. And the other one was another woman named Shirley. And that's what she was referring to. What the FBI did was it put it out there for any takers. And there were takers, and that's what's significant. When I talked with that woman, she said to me, Romaine believes the stories. But those stories were simply wrong, for the child's father was a young Mexican revolutionary named Carlos Navarra, whom Jean had met while she was making that film in Mexico. Jean tried to explain that to Romain Gary, on whom she continued to rely for psychological support, even though they were no longer married. And her failure to convince him shattered Seberg. Just hours after reading that Newsweek item, Gary said later, Jean began to have severe contractions. She was rushed to a Geneva clinic and gave birth to a premature female infant. The child, who died two days later, was white. So Jean took her baby back to Marshalltown to prove to friends and family that the Newsweek story wasn't true. The body of the infant, christened Nina Hart Gary, was displayed in an open casket for two days. After the burial, Jean flew back to Paris, and she fell apart. Robert Logan a friend of Jean's for 20 years, recalls the moment he came to visit her there and pay his condolences. He was let in by a woman he didn't recognize. It was an old woman, a heavy-set woman, a stooped woman. And I just started to ask, is Jean, and I realized I was looking at Jean. And I just couldn't believe it. I was stunned. You could just see how broken she was you know she was just really it was like even talking to a totally different human being and so you what happened well we sat around and talked and she explained the Joyce Haber article and she she had them all there on, a, on, a, on her table the Newsweek magazine piece had appeared prominent magazines were putting out this unbelievable story 
this incredible lie. And she must have thought, well, where do they get this? She must have thought the whole world was against her. For the rest of her life, Jean was to become increasingly psychotic, in and out of nervous breakdowns and mental clinics. In 1972, she married a young filmmaker, Dennis Berry. Their relationship was marked by its unevenness, and the couple separated in 1978. Gladys Berry was Jean's mother-in-law and her friend. Jean called Gladys her Parisian mother. And even after her son Dennis left Jean, Gladys kept up the relationship. During the last few years of Jean's life, it was Gladys, more than anyone, who was witness to the severely troubled individual Jean had become. For instance, Gladys remembers Jean paralyzed while she was in a mental clinic. She was there for some weeks. I really don't remember how many. And just very inert, flat on the bed with dead eyes and a dead voice. And then suddenly I arrive one day and the nurse says she's leaving on Saturday. And I went up to see her and there she was very vigorous, not paralyzed at all, and full of life and vitality. And she was going home in a couple of days. And I said, how did you, how did that happen? What, she just, just, just willpower. Her fantasies became real. She was in touch with reality. She'd know who everybody was but she'd believe the fantasies. One day she came to my house and she said, I went yesterday to see John claude in the hospital in St. Cloud. And while I was there, I put on a white uniform and helped with an open heart operation. It was as if she was, you know, omnipotent. She could do anything, fix anything. She was on a high that night, but completely out of her mind. In 1974, a young Frenchman named Philippe Garel had made a silent, experimental film of Jean called Les Hautes Solitudes, The Extremes of Loneliness. To watch it is to see the Jean Seberg Gladys Berry described. Les Hautes Solitudes is art imitating life. The last years of Jean's life found her involved with a succession of lovers. One of them, a young filmmaker, Jean-Claude Messager, a shy, gentle, appealing youth who was 17 years younger than Jean. Speaking sometimes in English, sometimes in French, he tried to explain the woman Jean Seberg had become. She could not feel French because she did not have a French background, but she rejected America. She would say everything she could against Americans, that she would never return to the United States. Nothing would entice her. That was because of this story about the FBI. Mm -hmm. Did she ever talk to you about her baby who died, Nina? Yes. What did she tell you about Nina? It was because of the FBI, that's all. What did she say about the FBI? She said the FBI killed her baby. At bottom, the death of Jean's baby seems to have been the event that drove her to despair. Her second husband, Romain Gary, who was himself to commit suicide in late 1980, said publicly that every year, on the anniversary of her baby's death, Jean would try to take her own life. Finally, as she had acted it out in Les Hautes Solitude, she did indeed choose suicide. What did you think about all those FBI stories? Well, when uh, I heard it first, uh, we had relatives and friends in the house, and I screamed. And I probably used a little profanity. I said, if this is true, why in the Dickens didn't they shoot her and get rid of her instead of having all this travail that's gone on since. I have this flag here in the corner of the house here that I used to put out every morning. I haven't put it out since. 